Thank you to the RPJ band. We'll see more of you later. There's something about that music. There are a lot of you going like that during that. Very good. All right, you guys have had a very busy week. Let's take a look at what you've been up to. to be back in Barcelona for Cisco Live. You will build a bridge through your combined contributions through the week. Cisco Live is a great place for learning. There are unique opportunities to connect with Cisco experts. We can network with peers and share ideas and insights. Speakers are incredible and I learned so much. many great discussions with so many Cisco partners. There is so much to do and so much to see. You have to be here. Cisco Live TV. All the Cisco training you need in one week. Fantastic. You really have had a busy week. I, I am glad to see that most of you made it out of the escape rooms, by the way, so well done for doing that. I have to say, I think I've lost a few members of my team. I haven't seen them since Tuesday. I think they might still be there. But, uh, you know, boy, you really do like to play, don't you? Swings, table tennis, drones, 4,000 of you rode on that VR travelator. And uh, you like buying stuff as well, did you know that? You buy a lot of stuff in the Cisco store. And you know what the top selling item is in the Cisco store here this week? Any guesses? Socks. Did you guess? Socks. <laughs> did you forget to bring your socks? Oh, yeah. I was surprised. I don't know what that says about you, but it says something. I'll leave that up to you. But most importantly, of course, you've learned a lot in the sessions this week. And uh, 5,000 of you found your friend in the Find My Friend app. Apparently, 2,000 of you are still looking for your friend. But uh, we'll leave that for another day, too. Now, on Tuesday, I said that you would be building the virtual bridge in the bridge experience. And 12,000 of you, sorry, 1,200 of you interacted with the bridge pillars in the playground. And uh, 11,300 connected with each other in the WebEx Teams rooms uh, during the sessions. 
And you like to bring a lot of devices with you as well, don't you? How many have you got? 27,600 devices connected to the network. Well done, that's all I can say. 50,000 total viewers online during the first two days, and a million minutes of online viewing just in those first two days, which is pretty impressive as well. And of course, you've been busy painting and building those skateboards, which will now go to children in need through the local charity organizations, which is wonderful because they really are children that couldn't afford to buy anything like that. Thank you very much for building all of those. So there really is a lot at Cisco Live, as you know, including what goes on in the DevNet community, and it's been hugely active through the week, over 125 sessions over the three days. And on Tuesday, I spoke about the Gateway here, which is a, a program we launched a couple of years ago, and I'm delighted that through the week, we've created 35 new video case studies with you filming in the booths there. The 32 customers that were speaking in the sessions, they were packed out. You love those, standing room only. Thank you to the customers who presented. It's great to have you doing that. These are your words, your stories, um, and they really help others understand what is possible. And over 1,000 of you actually signed up to the Gateway program as well during the week. And this really is a gold mine for those of you who do that. It's an opportunity actually even for career development and growth for you all. So thank you for doing that as well. And in fact, one of our most active gatewayers will now be joining us in Cisco Live in Melbourne in a few weeks' time. So let's take a quick look, summary video of what's been going on in the gateway this week. I just joined Gateway. I just joined the Gateway. Welcome to the Gateway at Cisco Live 2019. Let's have a look inside. I'm very happy. The company had a lot of visibility. The video has been seen almost 2,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is sharing their opinion, and this is a perfect place to share knowledge between IT guys. You get to connect with the other people in the gateway as well, you have to learn from each other. The more people you can talk to, share experiences with, the better. Everything is, is perfect here. You can make good connection. I'm able to find feedback from colleagues and peers around Europe. There are lots of prizes to be won. Massage, place where you can sit, recharge. It's a cool place to hang out. No, que nunca falta el detallito, entonces nos apoya muchísimo. The Gateway has been the best social experience I've ever experienced with Cisco. It is a very happening place, and I enjoy it. I love the Gateway. Join, invite your colleagues, invite your friend, and let's have the community grow and grow and grow. Sometimes I think it's going all Italian, you know that. <laughs> and remember, you can still visit the Gateway this week. It will close tomorrow lunchtime. And if you haven't joined this week, you can still join after the event online, of course. Now, I introduced the, the Global Problem Solver Challenge uh, on Tuesday, and we asked you to vote on what you thought was the best project. And as a reminder, it was the cholera detection kit, the stove burning less biomass generating electricity, and the energy monitoring solution, which is also alerting unusual activity. Very innovative, very worthwhile projects, and I'm delighted that we will be presenting the winner of that as voted by you here right now, which is, will be a check for $20,000 to help accelerate that project and get the teams to continue. And we'll give them a pair of Cisco socks as well. So I'd like to invite you onto the stage to receive your check, wherever you are. <laughs> you weren't expecting that. Congratulations. I love the look on your face. That was brilliant. There you go. There you go. I, I, I promise you it will go on the plane. No problem at all. And uh, 
Of course. Do we get the socks in the picture too? Of course. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. I wish I had a camera for the look on their face. <laughs> when I said, you won, you've got to come up. I'm not going up there. <laughs> At Cisco, we are positively impacting a billion lives by 2025, as I talked about in the opening keynote. Now, there is someone who has been solving global problems for a number of years. And when you think of a global problem, there is nothing more daunting than a problem that truly affects all of humankind. And our guest speaker is someone who does just that. When medical science runs out of options, actually, it's the engineers that take over and really can help. This is a story that spans 60 years, 282 countries, and has, means that millions of people all around the world are still alive because of it. Now, this presentation does contain some images that you may feign, well, they may be a bit shocking, frankly, but they are actually a poignant reminder that these are things that actually, thankfully, we'll never see again. I have to say he's brilliant because he is Dr. Larry Brilliant. We are started. We are gold. Hi, everybody. I like that music. By the time we got to Woodstock, we were half a million strong. And this is the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. I'd like you to join me in thanking the band, RPJ. Thank them for their wonderful music. And thank you, Jeremy, for that introduction. Thank you, Bonnie and Janet and John, all the others at Cisco who invited me. I'm really happy to be here. I was really happy to hear Jeremy talk about affecting positively a billion people in the next 10 years. I'm a big fan of the Cisco Foundation, Peter Tavernassi, Tai Yu. The vision that Cisco has had is one that I share so much. And I've had the pleasure of working with them when I was at the Google Foundation, the Salesforce Foundation, and the Skoll Foundation. Today, I want to talk to you about several ideas and programs all over the world, three in particular, that have or will have the chance to affect even more than a billion people in our lifetimes. I'm going to bring you three stories from my own field which is epidemiology and medicine. But here's the twist. In each story, you will find that the program ran into an obstacle, an impasse, or stumbled. And then along came a great engineer, or a geeky doctor, with an idea and an innovation that helped us break up that logjam and that problem. Sometimes it's hard to find the engineer when we're talking about medical solutions. They get lost in the story. So I want to play Find the Engineer. And we try to unpack these stories and find where the geek helped the doctor solve a problem. And because I'm a physician, and I work to help eradicate smallpox, and I work on pandemic and blindness, I think I can help you find the geek. And I, I fancy myself an amateur geek. I was vice president of Google. I worked at Intel. I'm on the board of Salesforce.org. I even have a little tiny patent. But I want to tell you how I first became a geek. It's one of my favorite stories. This is Nepal, the mid-Himalayas. We're near Mustang here. Some of you may have trekked in Nepal. You may have seen the carcasses of airplanes, helicopters, 
that didn't make it over the mountains. One or two planes that crashed in the riverbed near Tatopani or Jamsung. This picture is 1979. We're at a place called Ra Ra Lake. This was the first helicopter to ever land there. I'm sitting in that helicopter. I'm visiting that village. It's one of 108 villages that we chose at random through a stochastic process, a probability sample of Nepal, in order to do a survey of the causes of blindness. And I did that because my wife and I started something called the SEVA Foundation. We were working with the World Health Organization to do this survey. And when you do a random sample of villages in Nepal, a lot of them are going to be in the high mountains. And we had five eye doctors who could not climb mountains. And the monsoon was rapidly approaching, and our doctors were stuck in the mountains. We were lucky enough to get a donation of a helicopter from the Evergreen Helicopter Company in Oregon. This is an Alouette 3. In five more days, this helicopter is going to set the world's altitude record at 26,000 feet, with me in it as ballast as we try to climb through the mountains and visit every one of the villages. We would take our doctors. We treated 40,000 patients. We take our data in 1979 on paper questionnaires, and then we'd feed them into this new strange machine called a microcomputer. Here I am, I'm back in Kathmandu. The survey is going very well. By now, we have visited 105 of the 108 villages. The monsoon's coming. We have to get those eye doctors out. I'm bringing all the information into this Apple II. This actually happens to be Apple II number 12, one of the first microcomputers, and certainly the first microcomputer in Kathmandu. Now, how did I get one of the first microcomputers into Kathmandu? I brought it in my suitcase. They asked me if it was a typewriter, and I said yes. <laughs> but how I really got it is as I was preparing at the University of Michigan, where I was a professor, to get ready to go to Kathmandu, the phone rang, and it was Steve Jobs. And he said, I have just what you need for your blindness survey. An Apple, a Corvus hard drive. It's got five megabytes. Nobody will ever need more than that. You can't possibly need any more memory than five megs. And I got a great database manager. You'll be able to do your whole survey on it. It's the most incredible thing. It's called VisiCalc. And I'll give you a Hayes modem. It goes 300 baud. So there I was, pre-Cisco, pre-internet, sitting in Kathmandu with my Apple, my modem. <laughs> 300 baud, acoustic modem. So how did I know Steve Jobs? Five years earlier, when I was working to help eradicate smallpox and living in India, I was working at the World Health Organization in New Delhi. And our receptionist, Mrs. Edna Boyer, called me up and said, Dr. Brilliant, there's somebody in the lobby who wants to meet you. He's a hippie. He's barefoot, his head is shaven. Do you want to meet him? I said, hell yes. Who is he? He said, his name is Jobs. And I went down, and Steve wanted to come to the World Health Organization for two very good reasons. First, it was about 120 degrees outside, and the building was air-conditioned. Second, he'd been in India for six months, and he wanted one good salad. And we had great salads at the World Health Organization. I met Steve then. We became friends. We were friends until the day that he died. He not only gave me this apple, but he gave me the money to start the Seva Foundation. And the five million blind people whose sight we've restored in the last 40 years, they accrue 
to the good side of the ledger for Steve Jobs. So you see those spots there on the, on the map? Those are the 108 villages that we had to visit. This is a picture of the helicopter. This is the day before we were to go to the very last village. The next day, when I was back in Kathmandu, sitting in front of my computer, I got a call on a ham radio set, the worst words that you could possibly hear. The helicopter has crashed. It was in a very remote area. My boss, Nicole Grasset from the smallpox program, was there. She said that as they were lifting out of the last village, they heard an awful sound, and the helicopter had auto-digested itself, and it was falling like an oak leaf in the autumn. The pilot, who would win the Helicopter Pilot of the Year Award, grabbed the controls with white knuckles, and when Nicole said, what's wrong? He said, nothing, nothing. It's just a simple spare parts order. Engine, one. How do I get a new engine from a helicopter that has crashed in a remote area of Nepal when I'm sitting in Kathmandu? Well, we were next door to the World Meteorological Association office. They told me that there was a new communication satellite that had just been raised over Nepal, and it was flying over in geosynchronous orbit. They helped me use my Hayes modem to connect to that passing satellite. What I had to do was establish a meeting of the minds between the SEVA office in Michigan, the WHO office in New Delhi and Geneva, the U.S. ambassador in Delhi and Kathmandu, the Evergreen Helicopter Company in Oregon, Aerospatiale in Paris, the United Nations headquarters in New York, and Senator Hatfield, who had been our sponsor. That's what I had to do to figure out how to get a new engine brought into Nepal to take the helicopter out. I knew of a computer program at the university called Confer. It was running on a new Amdahl computer. I set up a computer conferencing call. I didn't even know what that was. With all these people in an asynchronous store and forward way, we got them all on one of the first global computer conferencing systems, and we worked out who would pay for the new engine, how it would be shipped, and it arrived in 48 hours. We drove Land Rovers to the disabled helicopter. 72 hours after the accident, the helicopter flew out on its own power to Bangkok with the old engine strapped underneath it. Nobody in the UN had ever seen anything work that well or that fast or get done that cool. That's when I became a geek. I was in awe of the technology. I fell in love with the technology. When the survey ended, we took our data back to the university. I was very surprised that the major cause of blindness in Nepal was cataract. I expected it to be glaucoma or trachoma, which is what we thought it was beforehand. While we were doing the data, I took that Confer program I customized it into something we called Save a Talk. I began to use it to run the Save a Foundation. I did not know it was an unusual way to run a foundation. Byte Magazine did a cover story. They called us a DO, a Distributed Electronic Office. Who knew? While I was playing with it, Steve Jobs came to visit me in Ann Arbor, stayed with us. I showed him Save a Talk. He had been our most generous financial backer. I asked him shyly if he would make another donation to SEVA. He watched the SEVA talk system, and he said, Larry, I'm going to tell you two things. First, that's the ugliest effing thing I've ever seen in my life. It's ASCII text. It's running on a green screen, and it's running on Unix, which is a stupid system that I will never use. 
Those of you who know, know. <laughs> However, that system that you've built, it has promise. It's your own product. So I'll tell you what, take your own effing product, make your own effing company, make your own effing money, fund your own effing project, and I'll help you. And he laughed, and he did. And I started a company called Network Technology. Steve got me investors. We took the company public in 1984, a year before Cisco was started. And the next year, we launched our most successful product. It was called The Well, the whole earth electronic link. I called up my friend Stuart Brand, who had started the Whole Earth Catalog. How many of you have ever seen the Whole Earth Catalog? That was the internet of the 80s. Everything was in the Whole Earth Catalog. You just had to look it up like this. We built a social network around that catalog. It was the first popular social network, and it continues today. It's still alive. You can still get on the well. And the reason was, we didn't accept ads, we didn't sell anybody's private information, and that's why it's continued to exist, that's also why it's so small. <laughs> Wired Magazine said the well was the next big thing. Since then, I have lived two parallel lives, one as a physician and the other as a geek. That's why I get to talk to you today about some of the greatest successes in medical history where geeks and engineers played such pivotal roles. And we're going to talk about how some of humanity's worst medical nightmares share a common theme and a common solution. And the common solution has always been engineers, their resourcefulness, innovation, ingenuity. You guys, when I run into trouble, it was always an engineer that bailed us out. And I'm going to do this by talking about three stories. And you're going to help me, because I'm going to talk about the medical side of it. And as Jeremy said, some of the images are hard to look at. But when I tell you about the problems we ran into, we're going to find an engineer or a geeky doctor or a wannabe geek who built something, created something, it helped us figure out a way to make it work. And I'm going to start with the worst pandemic of our lifetime. And because it's 1919, this is called the 1918 swine flu, but all of the people in my world call it the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. Now, I have to tell you, for all of my Spanish friends who are here, the Spanish flu had nothing at all to do with Spain. In fact, it's the Spanish who were the good guys. This was the First World War. This is a terrible disease. Every country except Spain had military censorship. Spain was neutral. Spain had nothing to hide. Spain freely and openly told us where the disease was, where it had spread. We got to study it. We understood how to interdict it, how to stop it. If every country had behaved the way Spain behaved, this epidemic would not have killed 100 million people. Spain also told us something else. They taught us that early detection and early response to an epidemic means that the outbreak will be tiny when you arrive. You can squish it. You can end it with just social distancing, quarantine, because you're never going to have a vaccine or antivirals when you arrive on the scene. In fact, the Spanish flu probably began in France. It might have begun in China. It could have begun in Kansas. But Spain, because they were the good guys, they bear that title. And I ask my Spanish friends in the audience, bear that title proudly, 
because you were the only damn country that did the right thing. Spanish flu, the swine flu, the great influenza of 1918 went around the world four times in one year. We didn't have airplanes. We had no United Airlines, but it went around four times in one year. One out of every three people in the world got the disease. We say 50 or 100 million died, we don't know, because those numbers only count Europe and America. We weren't counting anybody dead from flu in China or India. It could have been many times that. If there were a similar pandemic today, and I worry about it, if there were a similar pandemic today, we would expect to see 300 million people die. It would cost us over $3 trillion. Bear that in mind as we talk about the efforts that engineers and doctors are making today to stop the next pandemic. These are low probability events, but highly consequential. It takes a very special kind of person to work on problems like that. I want you to understand the impact that that one year of flu had on life expectancy. From the beginning of the industrial age, every year human life expectancy increased. Every single year until today. Every year life expectancy, except one year. In 1918, life expectancy around the globe, all people, boys, girls, men, women, dropped by 12 years. Think of that world, think of the impact that that had on the world. Because of one event, one disease, life expectancy dropped by 12 years. That's why Bill Gates says another pandemic is the thing he worries about the most. And I share his fear, obviously. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit about why we feel that. And I'm going to use a movie that we made called Contagion to tell you a little bit about how pandemics usually begin. If I can have the video, please. Bats harbor many epidemic diseases. You know about rabies. Last week, we proved for the first time that bats harbor Ebola. They harbor SARS and MERS. This bat dropped an apple with saliva on it. It went from a bat to a pig, from a pig to a chef, from the chef to the dinner table, And now, we're about to kill off Gwyneth Paltrow. Now, this is fiction, but this is the way it happens. In the last 30 years, there have been 30 novel viruses with pandemic potential that have jumped from apple, animals to humans. In fact, SARS, MERS, Ebola, West Nile, H1N1, H5N1, bird flu, swine flu, they all have animal hosts. We can't stop outbreaks. Epidemics are inevitable, but pandemics are optional. If we build the systems that allow us to find those outbreaks early, we can squish them and stop them, and there will never be another pandemic. That's what thousands of engineers and doctors are working on all over the world to build early warning systems. I'm going to show you 
what we call an epidemic curve. In the old days, you see that flashing light. In the old days, the only part of that epidemic curve that we understood, that we reported, was from the peak over. And that flashing curve, that's a joke, because we're trained at CDC, where I trained, or WHO. If you're an epidemiologist, you want to arrive at the epidemic when it's already peaked. Because an epidemiologist that gets far in this world is one who arrives at the end of the peak, and they ride to glory on the downhill curve. We didn't understand the left tail. Look at it, because if you think about the way an epidemic works, and it grows exponentially, if you can arrive at it at the very beginning, when the first few cases are occurring within one incubation period, it's easy to stop. Even better if you can arrive two steps before the curve begins and do surveys of dead chickens if you're worried about bird flu. But everything to the left of the peak is a digital system that until 2008, WHO prohibited even taking, as they say, cognizance of a digital report. Things are changing. And one of the things that helped change it the most is what happened at Google in 2008, when three young engineers said they thought that they could decide how to make a system that would predict where the next pandemic would be and the route of influenza faster than CDC could do it. They actually said that what they would do is they would capture every keystroke ever entered into Google in 10 years, run 20,000 simultaneous multiple logistic regressions on over 5 million computers, and spit out the graph that you're looking at right there. And they succeeded in being able to build something called Google Flu Trends, which beat CDC and WHO, the Center for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization's ability to find influenza by two weeks. Give me two weeks, because if you give a virus a two-week head start, there'll be hundreds of thousands of cases. If you give a virus a six-month head start, there'll be a billion cases. What these three engineers did was unbelievable. It changed my field. It changed epidemiology, it changed medicine. They created a whole new branch of science, digital disease surveillance. And in fact, we all got together and decided we were gonna publish it in Nature, which is a magazine not for engineers. It's for physicians and scientists. And if you take a look at the first three names on that article, you will see that they're all engineers. There has never been an article in Nature magazine where the first three authors were all engineers. It changes everything. Because instead of us arriving as a doctor to an epidemic, we're now figuring out ways that we can use existing technology and reporting systems to predict where that epidemic will be. And not only did we begin to solve a problem about flu, and pandemics, but they kick-started an entire new industry. And there was a proliferation of digital disease detection systems and companies that are gathering that information, building it together with hundreds of different innovations. Even that was not enough, because these are all top-down systems. In 2006, I was lucky enough to win the TED Prize. The TED Prize gives you a wish to change the world. I wished for a global early detection system that would speed up finding possible pandemics. But I was naive in thinking that just one top-down system would work. Instead, over the last 10 years, one of my colleagues, Mark Smolensky, has created a 100 times better system because instead of top-down, he's gone all over the world and work with thousands of engineers, epidemiologists, to build systems like this in 35 countries, the countries most at risk 
of having an epidemic that would become a pandemic. He created something called EpiHacks, bringing together engineers, public health workers, veterinarians, agriculturalists, putting them together in a, in a room and building a system that's custom fit for that country. And it's working. All over the world, these EpiHacks are creating more confidence in the public health system. And if any of you here who are technical and want to volunteer someplace, and you're from one of the dozens of countries that I understand are attending Cisco Live, let me know, because there's always room for more people in the EpiHacks. And let me show you why it's really worth it. Here's why. This is called the time to detect graph. The key thing in stopping a pandemic is the time it takes to detect the first cases. I don't mean just the very first case when a virus jumps from an animal to human. I mean the first case when it jumps from an animal to human and then the first case when it goes someplace else. If you can have a system that finds that outbreak within one incubation period, we can end it. There'll never be another Spanish flu or any other kind of pandemic. When we started, it was six months. That's how long it took to, to find the Ebola outbreak four years ago. You give that virus a six-month head start, there'll be a billion cases before you know about it. Now we're down to three weeks. We're going to push that curve down as close to zero as we can. That's the way we stop pandemics. That's the way we make the world safer. And we couldn't do it without engineers. Now I'm going to shift. I'm going to talk about the second story. We're going to talk about blindness. And we sort of live in a, a post cataract surgery world. We live in a, a post artificial implant in the eye world. How many of you have parents or grandparents or yourself who've had cataract surgery? Raise your hand. Everybody look at them. They have something put into their eye called an IOL, interocular lens, an IOL. It's a piece of plastic or a piece of glass that's put in the eye after the cataract is removed. Let me explain a little bit about that. I've chosen a picture which is unusual because normally cataracts affect both eyes at once. This is an unusual cataract, but I wanted you to be able to look at a normal eye and then an eye with cataract so you could see what it looks like. The Greeks named this disease cataract, which we, we sort of know that a cataract is a waterfall. Because to the Greeks, as you got older, and it's called senile cataract in most of the literature, but as you got older, you would feel like a a drape or a cloud or a blind was falling down, making you blinder and blinder, like a cataract falls. That's the origin of the name. It seemed to the Greeks like a shade was pulled down over your eyes. And you can see from this slide the difference between a healthy eye, which has a transparent lens, just like your camera, where your retina is like the film or the digital receiver at the end of it. And now let's look at one, a cataract eye. The lens has become opaque. Nothing comes through except a little bit of light. So you want to get that thing out of your eye. And, you know, people even think that in history, Oedipus Rex and all these other stories, when people tried to cut out their own eye, they're really trying to pull out that blinding cataract that's inside of them. In fact, a, a, a specialty of primitive medicine arose where you would take a thorn or a knife and just push it into the eye to dislodge that cataract. It's called couching. And when I first went to Nepal, this is the way the cataracts were treated. Before modern surgery, you would create an aphakia lens an eye without a lens at all. It's better not to have a lens. But if you don't have a lens, and this is the surgery that you've had, then you're going to have a pair of glasses that look like this. And you're going to break them, and you're going to have to get them replaced, and then you're going to lose them, 
and then you're gonna be blind as you were before. So it, it doesn't work. We have to find a way to take those eyeglasses, miniaturize them, and put them inside the eye. And that sounds ridiculous, but there are today 25 million people blind with cataract who are getting eyeglasses that are miniaturized and put inside the eye after their cataract lens has been removed. And 62% of all the world's blindness is due to this disease. And when I say there are 25 million people who are blind from cataract today, there were 25 million blind from cataract 30 years ago. And that's a great thing. Why is that a great thing? Because the aging of the population and the demographic transition, we would expect 100 million to be blind today from cataract, except for one man, Sir Harold Ridley. Harold Ridley, who is one of these geeky doctors that I told you about, he's actually the founder of the field of biomedical engineering. And he's one of the founders of the entire field of implants. He was an army doctor during the Second World War. British aircraft would be shot down. Some of the pilots would have shrapnel in their eye. About half the pilots who got shrapnel in their eye got metal shrapnel. Those eyes died. They never recovered. Half wound up getting a piece of shrapnel that was just like a, a little tiny piece of the plexiglass that was in the cockpit. And when it broke, it created a shard. And when that went into their eye, he looked and observed nothing happened. The eye did not have an immune response when plastic was put in it. And he got the idea, what if I can take that plastic, retrofit it, mold it, take out the cataract lens, and put in that plastic? And this was crazy to eye doctors who, for hundreds of years, their whole business was removing things from eyes. Splinters that were in eyes, stones that were in eyes. But he pursued it, he partnered with a bunch of engineers, and he created the first interocular lens. That lens changed the history of ophthalmology. The problem was that it was really expensive. So this became a treatment for the elite, for the rich. The surgery used to cost $3,000. The lens used to cost $300 to $500. And it's a wonderful thing, but it doesn't do anything for the poorest and most vulnerable in the world. You can't reach a billion people and give them back sight, as Cisco's talking about, if you only have a $500 lens. It's inappropriate technology. Appropriate technology would be if you could make that lens for a dollar and distribute it to everybody. But that's impossible. No, it's not. The Seva Foundation started working with the Arvind Eye Hospital in India. We had a crazy idea. What if we could take one of these manufacturing plants that makes a $500 lens and bring it to India and bring in a bunch of Indian engineers who understood how to take the cost out of manufacturing? That's also what an engineer does. Could we find someone like that? And we found Dr. Balakrishnan, who was at the University of Wisconsin, where he got a PhD in manufacturing engineering. He went back to India, he built the assembly line, and he went about manufacturing IOLs up to FDA specs. And here's another place where the engineers were the sine qua non that great Latin expression, that without which millions of people would not see today. He drove down the cost of IOLs. He drove it down unbelievably by 99%. Instead of a $500 lens, he's manufacturing these lenses for 86 cents each. This year they shipped 2.8 million lenses to 150 countries. That's what an engineer does. I can't do that. Epidemiologists and doctors can't do that. You should be really proud of your profession. Not just because of the original idea, 
but because of the way it was made practical. These guys are great. And, you know, your return on investment are a bunch of happy Tibetan smiling faces. Every slideshow should have a picture of happy Tibetan smiling faces. But it, it's, it's still not enough, because this is 2019. It's not 1985. We want to take our technology and go farther than that. So what's the first thing that comes to mind? Obviously, seven out of nine. Star Trek, right? The Borg. Or Sergey Brin's Google Glasses. Just as Harold Ridley got the idea, can we take eyeglasses and miniaturize them and put them in your eye instead of your lens, now ophthalmologists and engineers are working together asking the question, can we take Sergey's Google Glasses and miniaturize them and put them inside of the eye in place of the lens? You can stay tuned and watch this space, or you can jump in and find ways that you can use your unique skills to bring the next advance in engineering to sight, to vision. I hope there's somebody in this audience that will be turned on by that and go after that as your next adventure. For my next adventure, I'm going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. This is what Jeremy was talking about. The first disease in human history to be eradicated. The word eradicate has within it the root of a word for radish, which means root. Eradicate means to pull it out by the roots. So when we talk about eradicating a disease, we're not talking about treating it or preventing it or conquering it. We're talking about eliminating it forever. Smallpox is the only disease that has been eradicated. I am optimistic that in the next year, we will see the eradication of polio. Many times when you go through an airport, you may see the signs, we're this close. There were only 17 cases of polio in the world last year, and only in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But to date, and I hope to God, polio joins the list. I'm getting a little lonely with smallpox being the only disease in history to be eradicated. But let me tell you how we did it. And let me tell you the opportunities, I think, that opens up for engineers and epidemiologists around the world. Well, first of all, there's a game that epidemiologists play, which is my virus is worse than your virus. I think I have all the chips in that game. Smallpox goes all the way back in history. It's probably one of the biblical plagues one of the 10 plagues in Exodus is called spot, and it means boils. Job may also have had smallpox with his plague of boils. But in the 20th century, not in 500 BC, but in the 20th century, which I remind you was only 19 years ago, in the 20th century, smallpox killed as many as half a billion people. Now, that sounds like a wordo. 500 million people probably died of smallpox in the last century. It is a disease that the poets and the literature writers of old England would exempt from the category of diseases because they would say smallpox is not a disease. It has always been with us. It's a condition of life. No one believed that we would ever be able to permanently eliminate smallpox. And the proof of that was that three dozen kings and queens and sovereigns died from smallpox. Being the richest and the most famous could not stop you from dying from this disease. Now, I see that and I say, well, that proves that we're all in this together. We're all equally vulnerable. The other way to look at it is this was one terrible, shitty disease. And it's a terrible way to die. So bad 
that people were willing to take great risks to prevent it from their, for their children. Uh, I love this slide. <laughs> this is a slide of something called variolation. It's not vaccination, but it is a form of immunization. The man in the slide has taken smallpox crusts and chewed them and is now pulverizing and making them into an aerosol and blowing them into the nose of the child. Obviously, the man must have already had smallpox, must be immune, but the child didn't. This process of variolation killed one out of 10. But that was better odds than the inevitability of getting smallpox, and one out of three, or one out of five, or one out of two would die. Variolation was so prevalent that Napoleon required it of all the French legionnaires working and fighting up until 1805. Because it was better to have an army that was immune to smallpox than to fall prey to smallpox in the middle of a battle. There was one amazing breakthrough. And I, I, please think about this. To me, this is at once the most preposterous and the most exciting experiment or insight in medical history. The man is Edward Jenner. The year is 1796. The boy is Dan Phelps. The woman is Sarah Nelms. She's a milkmaid. Edward Jenner, living in Bristol, in near Barclay in England, he, he got this idea. He had heard that milkmaids had the most beautiful complexion. And, you know, when I first heard this as a kid, I thought, well, the milkmaids have access to milk. Maybe there's something about milk that gives you a nice complexion. It wasn't that the milkmaids had a better complexion. It was that every other woman had pox on her face. Smallpox was so ubiquitous that scholars think of Jesus' 12 disciples, eight probably had pox on their face. Of Buddha's disciples, 50% had pox on their face. It was so ubiquitous that the people didn't even write about it. So Edward Jenner thought that milkmaids had something which prevented them from getting smallpox. And he noticed in the cows that they were milking, the udders of the cow occasionally had sores on them, pox lesions on the udders. And in some preposterous leap of faith, he thought, what if I scrape off the pus from the udder of a cow and I inject it into this boy and I send him off into the marketplace where there's smallpox everywhere, if he comes back and he's not dead, that will tell me that my experiment worked. I don't think he'd passed human subjects review today. But that's what he did. And then he did it over and over and over again. And he conceived of an idea that is called trans-species cross-immunity. The idea that you could take a disease of an animal with a different virus, give it to human beings, and they would become immune. And that's the beginning of vaccination. Because vacus, the origin of the word vaccine means cow. So when somebody is getting vaccinated, they're getting a piece of a cow. Now, this process of vaccination has gone through many different iterations. I'm going to show you where the engineers come in. Because the first few ways we had to vaccinate people was decidedly unpleasant. And it led to, as you might think of, the first anti-vax movement in history. You want to see the first anti-vax political poster? Here it is. 1805, this political cartoon showed that people who were vaccinated against smallpox became cows or bulls. And if you got vaccinated against smallpox, you would turn into some bovine reprehensible character. Well, we got through that period. I want you to know how bad smallpox was 
compared to everything else in history. In the 20th century, the two great wars, the genocide, the Cambodian genocide, the Russian and Chinese revolutions together killed nearly 200 million people. In that same period, smallpox killed almost double. It got so bad in 1965, which was the summer of love, three million children died in the summer of love. It wasn't the summer of love for them. They died from smallpox. Professor Vladimir Zhdanov, who was the health minister of what was then the Soviet Union, he came to the World Health Assembly with an outrageous idea that all the countries in the world would cooperate on one singular global, global activity, which was to eradicate smallpox. Now, there had been three other propositions like that before, to eradicate yellow fever. That didn't work because monkeys don't like to stand in line and hold out their paws, and yellow fever has a host, an animal host in monkeys. Malaria, because we didn't do too well with the mosquitoes, and another disease called yaws. So this was the fourth time that somebody proposed the idea of eradication. But this time, it took, because he put a time limit on it. He said, I propose that all the countries of the world share our resources and eradicate the worst disease in history within the next 10 years. Well, we had a problem, and the problem was the vaccine and the method of delivering it didn't work very well. My friend, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, will help us understand why that was. If you take a look at him, how serene he is, I'm going to do a close-up on his right arm. I don't think he'll mind. And he has four vaccination marks. They were all made with a rotary lancet, which is a prehistoric, barbaic way of vaccinating. But he was vaccinated four times because there were four sects of Buddhism in Tibet while he was still in Tibet, in Lhasa, in the mid-50s. Terrible outbreak of smallpox hit. And each of the four sects thought they had the stronger vaccine, and they wanted to vaccinate the young Dalai Lama to keep him alive. So he's got four scars, which when he was younger were terrible scars. And here's the instrument of his torture. This is the way we vaccinated everybody in 1965 with a rotary lancet that would be stuck in your arm and twisted. It's no wonder that there was a little bit of resistance to the smallpox vaccination at that time. We got better, and we went into the 23rd century, and we used a hypo spray. How many of you recognize Beverly Crusher crushing the neck of Commander William Riker, who Picard called number one? There's a couple. Well, we had an equivalent of that. We called it a jet injector. But it couldn't go to villages because it was tethered to electricity. We needed a breakthrough. Our method of eradicating smallpox was to find every case of smallpox in the world at the same time and draw a ring of immunity around it. In India alone, we had 150,000 search workers. We visited 500,000 villages, 120 million houses. We made 20 visits to each of those houses. We made over 2 billion house calls. Do you know any doctors that have made 2 billion house calls? But in order to eradicate the disease, we had to find every virus. Then we had to get vaccine and vaccinators and the instrumentality of vaccinating to every single person in that area. And to do that, we use this card, this photograph of a child with smallpox, and we had to turn every villager into a vaccinator. When I started in the smallpox program, it was a six-month diploma course to become a vaccinator. Now we're going to turn every villager into a vaccinator because of one man, Benjamin Rubin, Ben Rubin, who saw his grandmother's sewing needle and in his engineering mind, he envisioned, could I use that hole in the sewing noodle to hold exactly a drop of 2.5 microliters of vaccine in the meniscus? 
because if I can, I can make that sewing needle for pennies, and we can distribute it to everybody, and we can have every villager be a vaccinator. And that's what he did. He invented and patented the bifurcated needle. And his company, Wyeth, donated the patent and billions of needles to the World Health Organization. This is what it looks like, exactly 2.5 microliters of vaccine. That's amazing. Because of Ben Rubin, because of the inventors of the PETA jet, because of the engineers who created freeze-dried vaccine, we could work all over the world and we could eradicate smallpox. And I want to just review these inventions and innovations because we had a vaccine against smallpox for 200 years before we could eradicate it until we had freeze-dried vaccine and bifurcated needles. In other words, the doctors labored for 200 years, the engineers rode in on a white horse, and we were able to eradicate smallpox. This is a certificate signed by all the countries in the world at the World Health Assembly. That's why your children will not have vaccination scars. That's why you don't need those little yellow cards at the airport going through customs. That's why millions of children don't die. This little girl, Rahima Banu, in Barishal, the Bay of Bengal, 15th of October, 1975, was the last little girl with killer smallpox. When she coughed, when the scabs fell from her arms and they landed in the hot sun of Bangladesh, sterilized those scabs, and the last virus of smallpox died, that was the end of an unbroken chain of transmission going back 10,000 years. History's worst disease ended forever because of the partnership between doctors and engineers. And while smallpox was a terrible global threat, humanity's resources have always risen to the occasion, as they did with smallpox, as they've done with blindness, as we've done with Spanish flu. But something extra is the engineers who add a resourcefulness and an ingenuity. And I want you to remember that it wasn't just the engineers, because I'm, I'm highlighting the engineers. But we live in a very divided world right now. Things are pretty tough out there. I want you to remember that the people who worked to eradicate smallpox were Christians and Jews and Muslims and Shinto and Hindus and Buddhists. They were pagans, animists, and atheists. They were black and white in every color of the rainbow. Every race, every language. And they put aside their differences. Even Russians and Americans worked together. Put aside their differences so we could together conquer this greatest of all threats. Now I ask you, how will you join that party? How will you put yourself into the flow of history? Join me and others in helping to solve the world's greatest threats. Help to write the next chapter of solving humanity's greatest challenges, because after all, you're engineers. Thank you very much. Thank you.